What a wonderful group of people. Nice to see you. All right, 2013 Gallup study of 25 million workers in 189 countries found that 13% of the people actually loved their job, 63% of the people were somewhat engaged in what they did, and 24% of the people hated what they did. And they do this every four years, and they get exactly the same results. So what are these 13% of the people doing that the others aren't? As we go through these principles this evening, I've come up with the fact that I've interviewed more than 26,000 professionals since 1973, and I've come to the conclusion that there are 10 basic principles that these people operate by. And as we journey through these principles this evening, I'd like you to ponder three simple questions. Are these principles all that difficult? Could we learn them? Could we teach them to our children? The first principle is that these people know their aptitudes. Now, I recommend that everybody, by the time they're in their late 20s, have extensive aptitude testing done and know what they're good at. So many people hate what they do because they have no aptitude for it. If you're not good at math, you're going to make a lousy accountant. I can't tell you the number of people I've interviewed that love sales because they loved people but they had no aptitude for selling. Most of us fall into a career that takes advantage of our aptitudes quite by accident. The Bureau of Labor Statistics tells us that the average 40-year-old in the United States has changed jobs 10 times. They also tell us that the average professional in the United States is going to change careers five to seven times. This is a trial and error method towards a life sentence of mediocrity. But if you know your aptitudes, you can hone a career. These people begin everything they do as a novice. They understand and adopt their own ignorance. They understand what Goethe wrote when he said that everything is hard before it is easy. They take everything they're going to learn and they break it down into its basic principles. And then because they have a lifelong passion for deliberate practice, that's exactly what they do over and over and over. They understand that repetition is the mother of skill. And no matter how many layers of knowledge they envelop themselves in, they still see what they do through the eyes of simplicity. And then somewhere along the line, quite by accident the first time, they fall into flow and the zone. There is no thinking, there is just doing. Time stands still. The work flows out of them effortlessly as though it was art, and they are the artist. It is joyous, it is fun, it is playful, it is even spiritual. Now, we wish this state would come every day, it doesn't. But the more it comes, the more often it comes, and the more often it is desired. Because it's this intrinsic joy that becomes as gratifying as the work itself. And it's this intrinsic joy that takes on a life of its own. These people have love and passion for what they do. Next to their spiritual relationships and their relationships with their family, they love what they do more than anything else. They'd rather do it than they would eat or sleep. Often you just have to force them away just so they can be refreshed. They are so passionate about what they do what they do transcends making a living. And they start seeing what they do through the light of how it's going to help other people, even all of mankind. This greater purpose and vision transforms their work into a calling. And it's that calling, no matter how large or small, that's their personal impact on the world. These people have a healthy balance of paranoia, courage, and grit. They wake up every morning no matter how good they are at what they do, and they go, can I do this again? Am I really all that good? The best metaphor I've seen about this is a quote by Thomas Friedman out of his book, uh, The um, World is Flat. Every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up and knows it must outrun the fastest lion or it will be killed. Every morning in Africa, a lion wakes up and knows that it must outrun the slowest gazelle or it will starve. So it really doesn't matter whether you're a lion or a gazelle, you'd better wake up running. 
Courage in this metaphor gives us the faith and the confidence to practice running even to the point of perfection. It counterbalances the paranoia that would freeze us into standing still, starve if you're the lion, or get eaten if you're the gazelle. And grit, grit is the perseverance to get up and keep on running, no matter how difficult and challenging it is, no matter how exhausted you might be, you get up and you keep on running. People who love their job and love their career develop a system of doing business. Process, process, process. These people focus on the process and they know they don't have to worry about the result. No matter how grandiose their goals are, they know that if they focus on the process as much as they focus on the goals, the goals will manifest themselves. These people develop personal rituals and routines. They have patterns in their life that allow their cognitive and emotional effort to focus on their work. Rituals and routines alleviate the cognitive, the conscious effort that it takes to make inconsequential decisions and minimize decision fatigue, allowing that energy to flow into their work. These people respect and understand the 10,000 hour principle. This was popularized by Malcolm Gladwell in his book, Outliers. Now I think the, um, it's a little bit simplistic because sometimes people can learn at 7,500 hours, sometimes 12,000 hours. But what's most important about this is that these people have to go to work with deliberate practice over very long periods of time and devote that kind of time to their effort in order to succeed. It depends a lot on their, uh, on their attitude, the teaching, and of course the environment. Then these people experience a tremendous number of failures and setbacks. It's not uncommon that somewhere along the line they go into their business and go, this sucks. I am lousy at this. Why in the hell did I ever decide to do it? And then they get a hold of themselves and realize that because they love what they do, they don't necessarily like it all the time. And it's their ability to persevere and overcome and, and work on that that separates them from other people. Then these people become unconsciously competent. It's said that when you reach unconscious competence, you can do 80% of your work by instinct, leaving the conscious and cognitive skills to focus on the 20% of the work that's the most difficult and the most challenging. These people have so many mental models of what can and will happen. They just know what to do. You know them, you take them a problem and they just know the answer. They seem to be a genius to other people, but it's their competency that makes them so. These people find mentors. Now, it would be great if you could find mentors who are not only good teachers, good practitioners, and good human beings, but you're not gonna run into very many of those. Most of the time, the mentors you got, you're gonna find are gonna be flawed. The doctor who smokes might be a great practitioner of medicine. The maniacal CEO that runs a wonderful company but has a lousy personal life might be able to teach us how to run a good company. Even lousy managers can teach us what not to do. People who love their job and love their careers are perpetual, lifelong seekers of mentors. And then these people become autodidactic. A person that's autodidactic has a growth mentality and they develop their own systems of deliberate practice. These people steep themselves in their own discipline and then they connect the dots of other disciplines into theirs and they show us the interconnectedness of things. They are innovators. They are trailblazers. They are lifelong students. They love great books, great movies, great sermons, and of course, great TED Talks. <laughs> then these people are compelled to become a mentor. They come a point, there comes a point in their career where they, they reach enlightened competency. They're almost forced to teach. They are so intuitive about what they do, they could take any student in their discipline and move them to the next level. These are the teachers that give us the aha moments. 
they are compelled to teach. They know that the teacher always learns more than the student, and they are lifelong, they become lifelong mentors. These people have a tremendous amount of humility and gratitude. No matter how good they get, they have humility. What they do never really goes to their head. They don't compare themselves to other people. Their biggest competition is themselves the way they were yesterday and tomorrow the way they are today. They have a healthy ego, but not a big ego. They have a tremendous amount of gratitude. An attitude of gratitude is an understatement for these folks. They get up every morning so grateful just to be alive and get to go practice what they do. Every day is a miracle. Every day is a gift. And their ability to go to work, they just can't believe it. Sometimes they're awed by the whole thing. They can't even believe they get paid to do it. These people write stories of their future and reframe stories of their past. I went to St. Louis University to become a doctor. I had this story in my head I was going to become a doctor. I had to reframe that story when I had to drop out of freshman chemistry right before I failed it. I had to tell myself that I wasn't going to be a doctor. I got a PhD in higher education administration with this story in my head that I was going to become a dean of a college and eventually the president of a college. Well, my beautiful wife, Chris, had to help me reframe that story because after I got the degree, she explained to me, you have a great degree, but you have no job. We are pregnant with our first child, and we're broke. <laughs> and we better go to Dallas, Texas to find a new career, which, of course, next to marrying her and having five wonderful children, that's the best move we ever made. And the last principle, and probably the most important one, is that People who love their job and love their career know that what we become in the process of getting what we want is more important than what we accomplish. No matter how large our accomplishments get externally, they will never grow to the extent that we grow internally. Our newspapers are full of stories every day of people who seem to have it all, but because they don't feed their heart and their soul, they implode and they oftentimes destroy themselves as well as other people. People who love their job and love their career understand the words of Alexander Solzhenitsyn that the purpose of this life is not prosperity as we know it, but rather the maturing of the human soul. So there you have it, 10 principles. There may be others, but these are 10 basic ones. So let me ask, are they all that difficult? Is there any reason we couldn't learn them? Is there any reason that we couldn't teach them to our children? So let me ask one last question. What can you do today to love your job so that you'll never work another day? Thank you. <laughs>